Hello everyone, Pine Aaron Apple here, and welcome to my review of the next four Miraculous Ladybug episodes. Horrificator, Dark Blade, The Mime, and Kung Fu. That's right, I told you we'd pick up the pace. But let's be honest, I have no idea when we'll do more Miraculous for like half a year the way this schedule goes. But hey, let's not dwell on that. Last time we talked about possibly my least favourite episode so far, Copycat, and a better episode that still managed to make me freak out, Dark Cupid. Let's see if these four episodes can all be good and not make me have a mental breakdown, as we get into Horrificator. The episode starts in class as they make an amateur movie, Adrian and Malen seemingly starring in it. Malen being the next character from the class to get a focus, and I like this way the show builds up its characters, having them as the focus and the Akuma, both adding towards being the emotional crux of the story. Like Nino in The Bubbler, Nathaniel in Eve Illustrator, Alia in Lady Wi-Fi, Alex in Timebreaker, and Kim in Dark Cupid last episode. Unfortunately, Ivan, as their fake monster, freaks Milan out too much, as she is quite a scaredy cat. So she gets scared every time they try to shoot her nutting up scene for the film, frustrating most of the class. Milan attempts to boost her confidence singing her happy song, which is apparently called Smelly Wolf. Let's hope there isn't an incoming lawsuit from Phoebe Buffay. But that doesn't last long as even her accidentally backing up into Adrian manages to freak her out. Of course, Chloe doesn't miss a beat and decides to choose ridicule as the theme of every time she opens her mouth, insulting Malen. Her having enough and leaving the class sobbing. The class waiting a whole seven seconds before one of them, being Ivan, decides to run after her. If I remember correctly, the two being in a relationship. Ivan uses his heart of gold to try and cheer up Malen, complimenting her and going so far as to give her a pin of his favourite band the Zombie Skull Crushers. But she still finds herself down in the dumps, and dashing away again into the bathroom, causing her to pop up on Hawkmoth's radar with another one of his ridiculous deliveries as he sends out an Akuma to her. Oh yes, so many emotions. Some fake, yet others very, very real. Back in class, Ivan and Nino yell at Chloe, and Marinette tries to help by keeping everyone else together, and on schedule. Chloe taking advantage of Malen's exit, and putting herself in the role so she gets to kiss Adrian as the script demands. Causing Marinette to make this face, which I swear I've seen somewhere before. So then, no, wait, I know, that face looks exactly like what someone would pull in Hoodwinked. Yes, that's what that reminds me of. Anyway, Alia snaps her out of it. Us learning Nino is to blame for the kissing scene's appearance, getting into an argument with Alia. And things are just going upside down as Chloe is starting to become a voice of reason, as Max becomes the class's ticking clock to the deadline to finish their film. Marinette figures out her solution, bringing back Malen, knowing there is nothing between her and Adrian, so she voyages out to find her. Chloe losing the title I gave her less than a minute ago and going back to bitchdom. The Akuma approaches, taking residence in Ivan's badge, turning Malen into Horrificator, making Marinette search for her a regular horror movie trope as Malen hides while Marinette investigates Malen's goo. That sounds incredibly wrong. <laughs> Alia comes to bring her back as the class is falling apart, and Hawkmoth leads us into an ad break by throwing his arms in the air like he just don't care. The class continues with the film, with Chloe taking over and Nino losing his marbles, and the arguments starting all over again. Marinette tries to placate the situation and gets Chloe away from the shoot, Alia getting the idea to have Marinette in the lead, so she gets the kiss with Adrian. And poor Nathaniel, he's just watching all this shit go down in the background, standing there holding this disc, which I don't know what it's called, but I think it's supposed to help with the lighting. Let him put it down for a while, I'm sure his arm's hurt by now. Also, I have no idea what it is, maybe this episode was recorded early, but I feel that there's something off with Chloe's voice. I can't pinpoint it exactly, but it's just kind of off. Horrificator pops up in the background again, attacking Kim and Max, as Chloe finally figures out that Marinette manipulated her. Marinette pulls some more of her awkward stalker shtick, 
Why am I supposed to ship these two again? And we see some of her terrible acting. Chloe busts back in before the kiss can happen, but while Chloe is busy monologuing, we hear Max and Kim being, I don't know, either brutally murdered, or they were mimicking the internet finding out someone is planning a female Indiana Jones reboot. FUCK OFF! Rose gives a strange, unneeded line, and the class rush out to find the disturbance, Nino filming the whole thing like a paranormal activity movie. The group finding some more goo and a clue. Nathan freaks out in his strange purple pants, and Adrian tries to flee away from the group to transform, cleverly leaving his shoe behind to make up for his absence seemingly disappearing, while Horrificator does whatever that is. Marinette follows Adrian's lead as Horrificator covers the school in goo to prevent escapees, that Julika is strangely calm about. Nino correctly predicts this episode is ripping off horror movies, and our heroic duo appear to the remains of the class. The heroes plan while Nino tries to film it, Horrificator seemingly trapping the missing people in the boiler room that looks far too advanced for this school, looking more like a damn spaceship or Tony Stark's laboratory, and we learn thanks to Hawk Moth that Horrificator grows in strength as it absorbs surrounding people's fear. Well, that was unnecessary. Chloe and Sabrina split from the class, and the rest keep investigating, finding Adrian's shoe, and watching Nathaniel get scooped away via Horrificator Tail, the monster making its presence known. All but Julika and the heroes run. Julika's almost out of character peppy reaction, both weakening the creature and giving me more of a laugh than I thought I would have. The monster chases our heroes into the courtyard, and the monster itself is animated well, giving a consistent and well-defined weight to it that makes it more investing. Ladybug figures out how Horrificator gains strength, and both our heroes are gooped after a well-shot altercation. Horrificator licks Ivan and takes Alex, while our heroes free themselves, Ladybug figuring out that Horrificator must be Malen and both Sabrina and Chloe are murked entertainingly. With a nice touch angle, our heroes and students get into the boiler room. Ladybug takes roll call of the eggs, Adrian having to duck down and pretend to be himself. Horrificator blocks the exit, so Ladybug calls for her lucky charm, getting guitar strings, and using a cart of utilities to her advantage. Cat activates his cataclysm and drops a bunch of pipes around Horrificator, Spider-Man 3 style. Ladybug uses the strings and other junk to have the remaining people calm Horrificator down with Melan's happy song she sung earlier. A nice sentiment, but skippable. And also, if anyone in the show had a brain, that might have just tipped someone off in the right direction as to Ladybug's identity. Ladybug gets the button once Horrificator is small enough and purifies the Akuma. Nino finishes filming and Hawk Moth rants. Not even an entertaining rant. Nino shows the final product to the mayor, who gives a fantastic non-reaction. The episode ends with Alia making an attempt at humour. So what were my thoughts on Horrificator? While Milen wasn't the most interesting character, Horrificator certainly felt like something new, an attempt at paying homage to many horror tropes of old, and it does well. The emotional heart of the story works objectively, but didn't really do much for me. The episode looked good, and although Chloe sounds strange in the first half, the performances were pretty good, even getting what feels like the longest and loudest Julika has ever been. So I'll give Season 1, Episode 11, Horrificator, a 6 out of 10. Now let's get into Episode 12. Dark Blade starts with our superhero duo having saved the day already, Marinette returning home in hopes of finishing her project, a box to contain her oddly shaped diary. The Tiki rightly worries over. Well, for one, what if someone finds out your ladybug? And two, what if someone finds out your ladybug? Marinette shows the box off, it working quite well, like a damn bear trap. And we see that Chloe's father, Andre Bourgeois, has been re elected as mayor for the fourth time in a row, reminding Marinette that the vote for her class representatives are tomorrow. The other bourgeois having held that position for far too long. Much like the mayor, I mean really, four terms? Who does he think he is, Putin? Tiggy tells her that she should run, psyching her up and cutely sitting on her head, but Marinette is worried that she already has too many responsibilities. As Marinette rushes to get to school, we learn of the mayor's competition. A whopping 3% of votes going to Adrian's fencing instructor, 
Armand de Argencourt. In class, Chloe is running for rep again, and Rose is the most relatable she's been in this entire program. As Marinette busts into the room, completely unable to make up a decent lie. Bustier giving the class until lunch to decide to be a candidate. Alia being a dead end, as running her blog is apparently a full-time job. Chloe goes around threatening people not to run against her, and not knowing her secret identity, Alex responds in her power stance by asking Marinette why she doesn't do it, but of course, can't give a coherent excuse not to, so ends up running at the last minute. Alia chooses to help Marinette with her campaign, and her classmates, obviously not Chloe, come to ask her about what she could do in the role, and Julika somehow able to say less, yet speak better than Marinette does half the time. Uh, you know, um, I don't, you know. <laughs> Chloe takes a page out of her father's book and decides the best way to win is to ruin Marinette. Meanwhile, the Bluenette herself plans Chloe's defeat. But Chloe is one step ahead, inviting Russell Brand, I mean, rock star Jagged Stone, to bribe everyone. Marinette hurrying out the door, not locking her diary away. What's the point of building a fucking bear trap for it if you're not going to activate it? Sabrina bullshits her way into Marinette's room, and we see Armand absolutely hand Adrian's ass back to him on the fencing mat, expositing about his family lineage, connecting him to one dark blade. But much like most reporters, Nadia, or at least that's how she pronounced her name in the episode, I'm not sure if that's correct, since the letter J rarely makes an I sound. She is Manon's mother, and decides to stick her nose where it doesn't belong and antagonize Armand, for losing the election. Another member of faculty asking how she got in, although the entrance to the school is clear and quite large, so I don't know why that's the question he goes for, but she does scamper away. This is enough for Hawkmoth to send the Nakuma after Armand, turning him into Darkblade, who looks alright, able to use his lasers and sword to turn others into his knights. Adrian is witness and transforms while Darkblade gets more civilians, including Adrian's bodyguard, the Gorilla. Cat begins to tussle with Darkblade using his staff as a sword, which feels all kinds of wrong, even if he's done it before, and Sabrina makes her way into Marinette's room. After a strange POV shot, she finally finds the diary, only for the bear trap to activate. Okay, it's not as ridiculous as I thought, it did actually work. Marinette makes it to see Jagged Stone, who looks utterly depressed, and although she fell for the bribe, Alia is still on Marinette's side. Meanwhile, the sword fight with Darkblade somehow made it all the way from the middle of street to the Pond des Arts. And as I predicted in my head when I first saw Cat use his staff as a sword, it's thrown from his hands during the fight. Cat escapes and follows the knights to City Hall, while Sabrina arrives still with a box on her hand. Marinette tries to get the people on her side, but Chloe is there to threaten her, only to be interrupted by the knight's horns. Darkblade challenges the mayor to a fight, and the army approaches City Hall, only for Cat to arrive just in time, and once again gets into a duel with Darkblade. Jagged Stone, the Russell Brand variant, decides to put his rock star skills to good use and try to stop the rioting crowd with the power of music but not knowing what to do as the fighters Scooby-Doo in front of him. He's turned, and both Marinette and Chloe try to take control of the situation, Chloe being horrible, but Marinette trying to come up with a plan. Marinette talks with Tiki, and decides to stay as Marinette to conduct her classmates, blocking the entrance and telling everyone to retreat, almost transforming before everyone leaves eyeshot. Cat is cornered, but saved, left sitting in this strange position, and the knights start World War Zing up to the building, being knocked down in quite humorous fashion. Darkblade uses his transformation abilities to make catapults, and sends himself to the top of the building, trying to replace the flag. While he's distracted, Ladybug approaches, completely throwing physics and the laws of the known universe by suddenly changing trajectory in midair, but only narrowly misses being split in twain. Cat knocks a few knights around, and Darkblade uses the flag to convert en masse. A kind of bullshit exaggeration and expansion of his powers, but whatever. This gives our heroes a time limit. Hawkmoth fucking around, and Ladybug finally decides to use her lucky charm. A toy or something of the like. Throwing it into Darkblade's armor to distract him and destroy his sword, then purifying the Akuma. Hawkmoth won't shut up, and Marinette makes it back to the class, who unbarricade themselves. 
Adrian appearing to awkwardly make a pun and dash off. Seriously, that was weird. But Marinette outs Chloe and Sabrina for taking her diary, cementing Marinette's win after a speech, telling them that she has a dream. Uh, no, wait, that's the wrong one. Alia becomes her deputy and the episode ends with the end card really making sure you know that the episode takes place in France. So what did I think of Dark Blade? Well, there were things I liked. The history was a nice touch to Armand's character, and the character drama, such as the mayoral vote, and the similar class vote worked well for all characters involved. But the villain was more funny than antagonistic leading to him not really having a menacing performance. And when the episode tries to up the stakes, it comes across as unprecedented and a little ridiculous when all episodes before seemed to give their villains quite narrowed down and specific abilities. The flag ability, not connecting to anything Darkblade has done before, and seemed quite strange when the rest of his abilities came from his sword. The other characters were fine, but didn't really have anything special to do. The C story of stealing Marinette's diary did at least have some connection to the B story of the class leadership, so I'll commend it for that, but apart from that I felt nothing from this episode. So I'll give it a 4.5 out of 10. Made competently, but not engaging at all, and some decisions baffled me. The next episode, The Mime, starts with Marinette meeting up with Alia after giving her an exclusive after the last battle. I mean, not much of one, but at least Alia's happy about it, with her fucking weird accompanying animations. And of course, Marinette fucks it up by dropping the phone. <laughs> no, not really. She got you. But then she deletes it. For fuck's sake. I actually smacked myself in the face when this happened, spurred on by a sense of pure cringe. The cringe? Cringe? Is that all you shitposting fucks can say? Milen then ends up bringing her father around completely unprompted. They literally just appear in Marinette's room to collect the final part of his play costume, the hat, specifically made to keep a photo of Milenius for luck. Then being called away by some bossy woman who looks like Sabrina's evil aunt. And sounds like the dubbed landlady from Kung Fu Hustle. Hello, Sa- Dad, uh, where are you? Yes, I had to pick up my hat. I need you here now. So, fat woman, are you the boss around here or what? Fat woman, my ass. Hey, I'm with the Axe Gang. Axe Gang, my ass. This woman, Sarah, is with the understudy of the play, bad-mouthing Fred as they wait on him. Marinette starts being tangled in lies, doing everything she can to stop Alia showing the deleted video to Malen, stealing her phone. Is Marinette a kleptomaniac? I'm pretty sure she stole Adrian's phone four episodes ago. I mean, look at the smile she gives the phone. Total psychopath. Chris, the understudy, tells Fred the wrong way to go, cocking up his chances, and only a street away, Alia finds her phone missing. Okay, back up. How the hell do you turn up missing? Cause nobody knows where you are when they realize you ain't there. But you can't be gone from one place and show up somewhere else entirely. So when you turn up, you're never missing. And when you're missing, you never turn up. Unless you a zombie. Tiki tries to stop Marinette, but her expert plan is to just refilm the shot in the exact same way to recreate it. Only seconds later, admitting to Malen that Alia's phone is at her house after she left it there. And going to give it back at the show. Marinette transforms as Chris manipulates Sarah into leaving without Fred. Chris totally not laughing evilly with an earshot. Fred arrives at the Louvre with way too many posters for his show. Sarah exploding on him as Chris is totally not evil in the background and Hawkmoth takes the chance to send an Akuma Fred's way. Marinette fails her plan in spectacular fashion and just like 50 meters away, Fred is transformed into the titular mime. And it's certainly a design choice, but to be honest, I think this is one of the best and imaginative power sets we've seen in a villain since Lady Wi-Fi. And I'm glad that it was such a strong concept they even put in the miraculous film, even if it could have been used better. As usual, the cops fail, and Ladybug manages to identify Fred from his hat first. I don't know if that's good since it fits with her character, or just stupid, considering you can see his face. Meanwhile, Natalie is covering up for Gabriel as Adrian is being driven to the show, and him and Ladybug share this lovely moment before he inevitably gets away to transform. 
The mime and the heroes do some cool fighting, which I'm sure is a nice break for the animators, but he escapes by miming a cell door that they don't even try to get over or around, but they do learn that he can only mime one thing at a time. Ladybug is almost tricked into vehicular manslaughter, and Cat takes the opportunity to flirt, both the mime and the heroes making it onto the bus for a cool fight sequence. And Cat does that. Meow. Ladybug gets in the car to talk with the troop, while Cat and the mime continue to do some good action. Chris, like a total wimp, admits his wrongdoings as the mime sword fights Cat, even cutting the frame. And Marinette makes a relatable reaction to Cat's pun, then using her lucky shoebox to make a DIY projector to make the mime mad. And I don't even want to start on how anticlimactic that solution is, but hey, it worked since he cuts the Eiffel Tower down, forcing him to use his ability in place, allowing our heroes to save the day. The sky suddenly turns violet, then sunset, and Chris apologises and we're all very happy. Except for Hawkmoth, who monologues. It's almost like he only ever does two things. Sends out Nakuma, monologues. At some point, I'm just going to have to stop putting it in these scripts. Marinette pulls Alia's phone from the trash she left it in, and although she spent all the time lying, she faces no consequences. But we do get a nice makeup scene repaying Alia by becoming Ladybug to let her interview her, which is also nice, but those feelings were soured by her making this face at her stalker crush. Wow, sitting through season one is really making me nihilistic. So this episode had a lot of good and bad. As the main villain, Fred is the mime was great and inventive, and it's nice having his connection to Melen, really helping to make our side cast feel fleshed out, especially considering she got her focus episode two episodes ago. Marinette's B story was a little annoying as we have to sit through her predictable antics, but the scene at the end with Alia was really nice. Adrian gets fuck all to do, but is fine while he's there. With all that said, I guess I'll give season one episode 13, The Mime, a begrudging seven out of 10, as I feel like it was inventive enough and tried a lot of things, but it failed in a fair few of those things. Finally, for this video, we are on episode 14, Kung Food. What a name. Never since Mr. Pigeon have I had such hope for our titular villain. We start with Marinette attempting to learn Chinese in an unintentionally funny way. Seriously, I have no idea why it cracks me up. In anticipation for her mother's uncle, a very famous Chinese chef, to arrive. And she is struggling to be good enough. Of course, once he arrives, she screws the pooch in a painful fashion and doing a weird dance along with it, but invites him inside while he does whatever this is with the flower she gave him. Marinette then does the usual and calls Alia when she can't figure out what to do on her own, which ends up being sending Adrian her way. Alia called me. She said you needed someone who speaks Chinese. Well, here I am. Translator at your service. Look out, Adrian. Your cat noir is showing. So they leave together, having a conversation in Chinese, but it turns out he can speak English like our leads, just not very well, which raises all sorts of questions considering Marinette was previously learning French to Chinese. It's like the people who dubbed this show forgot that they live in France. Chang is met by Andre for a cooking competition, the winner having their dish served at the Mayor's Hotel. What a great honour. The event covered by the reporter guy from Stormy Weather, Alec. Adrian is no longer needed, and Marinette apologises for him having to come out for little reason. But of course, being in Andre's hotel, they run into Chloe, who spends her time being insulting and casually racist. Her then claiming to be one of the judges, and getting into a funny spat with Marinette. And it's nice to see a bit of ladybug confidence in Marinette every once in a while. Not just her being so awkward that I want to turn the program off. Marinette is self-conscious, but Adrian butters her up, and we learn that the thing he was doing with the flowers was to add the petals to the soup. We had a nice scene of the Master Chef at work, although I've never seen a soup of that colour outside of the monstrosity Shion cooks in Tensura. <laughs> Chloe distracts Chang and fucks up the soup. On the judge panel are some familiar faces, and also Alia's mum. And of course, the soup is a failure, but Alec can't help but rub it in. Marinette knows what Chloe did and tries to help Chang, but he is more than a little distraught, 
So as he stares longingly at the olive oil, Hawkmoth makes his generic monologue and sends an Akuma, turning him into Kung Food, as Cheng realises Chloe was up to no good by looking at the olive oil. What is it with making correct deductions based on so little information in this episode? Both Marinette and Adrian assume Chloe had something to do with it as a petal fell from her. But the petal was in the dish that she ate as a judge, so it was hardly suspicious. Kung Fu uses his powers to enslave those who ate the soup, mirroring the racially insensitive villain of the week from Rosario Vampire, and sends them after Chloe. Kung Fu cuts off all exits from the hotel, using what looks less like soup and more like sauce you'd have with baked beans. Adrian splits from Marinette and she takes the opportunity to transform, as Adrian does the same, causing them to meet as they both synchronise to do this weird flip technique. Kung Fu has Chloe tied above a pool of soup and sends Jagged Stone off to find our heroes, Naruto running away. Jagged assaults the heroes with what I can only refer to as a seafood club, but is quickly and skillfully dispatched by Ladybug and Cat. Andre is the next to be sent as Cat decides to start flirting again. Andre actually putting up an entertaining fight, which is strangely out of character to how I remember him, but I suppose he only seems pathetic against the women in his life. Ladybug goads him into defeating himself in a bit of a rush job. Kung Fu antagonises Chloe many times, but his threats and her whines leave the scenes falling flat for me. But he sends Alia's mum and Alec to fight next, with some more funny food weapons. Unfortunately, I find myself liking these smaller fights and funny weapons more than what Kung Fu has done himself so far. Chloe starts to be lowered into the soup, but is saved and subsequently dropped. Ladybug, what took you so long? Just wait till I tell everyone you- ah! Hold on, play that again. Everyone you- ah! <laughs> Anyway, this starts off the main fight. Hold on, I'm just hearing it now. Is Kung Fu Todd Habercorn? Brat soup even more powerful with superhero flavor. You may call me Old Tier Milkovich. Ultimate milk sandwich? Because like the Akira meme, an image of Natsu Dragneel flashed in my head as he made a particular tone in his voice. The second villain he's played since Mr. Pigeon. Such a strange assortment of characters. Mr. Pigeon, Kung Fu, Natsu Dragneel. The fairy tale character's name doesn't even stand out there. Kung Fu summons multiple interesting weapons to fight with, but the battle is done with swiftly once Ladybug calls on her lucky charm to use his own soup against him. Not the most thought out plan, but it works. Cat destroys the bag that Kung Fu's weapons come out of, and Marinette purifies the Akuma. And Hawk Moth once again makes both a really underwhelming and cringeworthy monologue. Marinette asks for lessons as Adrian makes doe eyes, and Chloe is herded away. Chen getting the award once the soup is made again, and having a nice moment with Marinette as he dedicates it to her as they grow closer, closing the episode. So Kung Fu was quite strange, and that's probably the best way I can describe it. There aren't a lot of cons to bring up, just slight annoyances, things that didn't need to be there. But there also aren't a lot it excels at, so for simplicity's sake, I'll leave Kung Fu at the middle of the road with a 5 out of 10. Thank you everybody so much for watching my review of these four episodes of Miraculous. This was written in kind of a middle stage between me switching from the two episode format to the four episode format. So I'm hoping by the time we start the next Miraculous review video, which I've already written one quarter of, I hope the process will be a little more streamlined. As this was quite literally two separate videos, each containing two reviews, put together. Much like the videos I've done before this point, but I figured even with the long, long gaps between reviews, at that rate season 6 is going to start airing before we reach season 3. But anyway, once again, thank you for watching, like the video if you liked it, comment down below if you wish if there's something you'd like me to review on the channel, and consider subscribing to the channel and if you do read that notification bell so that you're told every single time that I make an upload. Once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next review. Bye. Toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in friendly packages with writing on the side.